ANA eLearning Academy is brought to you by CDN Graysheet, a trusted source of rare coin and currency valuations since 1963. Welcome. Thanks for joining us at the ANA's eLearning Academy today. I'm Andy Dickus. I work here at the ANA and I'm at ANA headquarters in Colorado Springs. And I'd like to thank the Gray Sheet for their continued sponsorship of this great program that we've had so much success with over the past, well, uh, over the past, um, well, really since uh, almost the, two years. the virus started. <laughs> yeah, almost two years. Um, today we've got something that I think is going to be a treat. I certainly am not well versed in the three cent piece. And I know a lot of people uh, admire the three cent piece, but it can be kind of an overlooked uh, uh, but interesting port of numismatics. So today we have Walter Ostromecki, who needs no introduction. He has 44 years of experience as a numismatic educator. He is a former ANA president. He is a former longtime ANA governor. And he's really an icon in terms of spreading the hobby, uh, outreach of the hobby. Uh, we were just talking about him in Albuquerque this last weekend, Las, we Las Vegas the weekend before. Uh, if there's a, an interesting or worthwhile coin show or coin initiative going on, chances are Walt's going to be there spreading his knowledge. So, again, thank you for joining us today, and I will give the floor to Walt. Thank you, Walt. Okay, thank you, Andy, for that great introduction. I also want to thank the folks for chiming in. I know it's earlier in the day than usual in some of the programs, but I hope you'll find this informative and educational. And perhaps if you do collect, you can share at the end, and we'll give you some information when that comes down the line. So the program entitled, Why the, Th Why the Three? A US three cent coin that is. Well, let's move on. If I can do this, there we go. So again, we'll ask that question and we'll also add a question to that one as well. And why also both in silver and copper at the same time. So we're gonna be learning about this, but first I wanna cover a little bit of history behind the three cent piece, its inception and its beginning. Now, many of us, or many people know, they figure, well, the three cent piece came about for a postage stamp. That was in 1851. But our story as we're gonna open today begins actually in late 1848. So the idea of authorizing a three cent US coin in the early 21st century may seem quite strange, but then again, it may not as coinage needs are ever changing. However, back in the 1840s, the three cent denominations seemed like a good idea to both members of Congress as well as the public. And why? Specifically because it would serve a vital need in daily commerce. And there was a lot shortage of small denomination coins at that time. As I mentioned just a bit ago, our story begins in 1848 in California with the discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill and the idea of a small size three cent silver coin. Hence, as I put it, the three cent coin was conceived or fathered by the California gold rush, so to speak, and co-mothered by the US Congress, the US Mint, and the US postal system prior to its birth in 1851. Here's sort of what it looks like on the left here. For miners in California, this is a prelude to our story, but gold ruled the day. And of course, with the discovery, it brought men, and of course, you'll notice the little yellow arrow, women. Look at her dress. Can you imagine working out there in the, in the fields and the wilds, dressed as she is with a bonnet, coat, long dress? Must, be, must have been awful, awful for them. But this is the California gold discovery was in a sense, responsible for the idea of the three cent piece being developed. And also California had some interesting things. Here's a gaming token from 1849. And it's interesting because if you look on the left there, you'll see it very similar in design to the $20 gold piece, which would again come out into circulation. So on that premise, our three cent history lesson or adventure as its conceptual birth child began on January 9th, 1849, courtesy of the US House of Representatives. Samuel Finley Benton of Ohio was chairman of the Ways and Means Committee there. 
and he drafted a letter to Mint Director Robert M. Patterson. And I just took, pulled out an excerpt there in the red, requesting proposals for a new one cent coin of reduced size and a new three cent denomination. These to be made or produced in copper and also precious metal. It doesn't list silver, but that was the intent behind it. This was done and a yes reply was sent to Mr. Vinton, but Congress never acted upon it any further of, com of Patterson's recommendation of two coins to be produced in special metal or silver metals. Here we have Mr. Vinton pictured on the left, as well as Mr. Patterson pictured on the right. However, later in 1850, Senator Daniel Stevens Dickinson of New York, chairman of the Committee of Finance, took up the one and three cent coin need cause. His committee was preparing a bill to, to reduce postal rates from five cents to three cents. And he was going to include the recommendations of Mr. Patterson's two new coins as it would address the acute shortage, a small value coinage in circulation at the time. The three cent piece would be an excellent idea to perhaps produce or buy postage stamps, as we shall see in just a bit. The new proposed coins would be one, a small size one cent coin, which is pictured on the right of your screen there with 0 0.100 silver and having a hole in the center. And secondly, a small three cent piece or coin composed of 0 0.750 silver. We never saw the one cent piece, but there is one. I think Annie's in our museum, if I'm not mistaken, on display for the public there at ANA headquarters. Well, Congress, however, did what it does usually. It did not act upon Senator Dixon's committee bill with the two proposals until early 1851. And only after the Senate had first passed the postal rate reduction bill, which would reduce the cost of mailing a letter from five cents, the current price, down to the three cents. The one cent silver coin idea was rejected by the Senate and removed from the final bill before it was passed. Congress reconsidered the need for a three cent coin after much discussion and authorized it as part of the Postal Act of March, 1851. The new law would take effect on June 30th, 1851. Why would it take so long? Well, the mint needed time to design the one which was out of it and the three cent coin and have enough struck to get them released into circulation. The new three cent coin was to weigh 12.38 grains and be 0.75 silver and 2.50 copper. Thus, the face value exceeded the bullion at the time and bullion is gonna rapidly grow. We'll see in, in the next few slides. At the time, it was only worth three pieces, about 86 cents of the gold comp comparison. And of course, it was not, with that low rate, it was certainly not going to be melted. Okay, so what prompted Congress to finally actually sign on and give the approval to the three? Well, there are, there are much divisions as it is today in our Congress to get things done, but we find that there was an utter distaste for the one cent piece, which in a sense made it necessary to have the three cent piece take become from become a reality. And the reason the one cent piece was discouraged because currently we had those large copper cents. That was also a negative. The Congress didn't like the whole, but this was what the design was. Secondly, Dickinson's own words, it is the only logical answer since many of the coins in paper and circulation were not legal tender at the time. They had a lot of shin plasters, business paper money from merchants, copper tokens. These of course were not acceptable as payment for US postage stamps. So what would, what would alleviate that problem according to what the government was looking at was to have this three cent coin struck to specifically be used at that time to buy stamps. And of course, Congress agreed. They also hoped the three cent would help sell postage stamps. It wouldn't need change. They could go in there with a three cent coin and give it to them, buy a stamp or whatever. 
and gain public acceptance as it contained silver rather than copper. While critics called it a new coin debased, the public and government initially, keyword, loved it. So let me give you an idea. If you're not familiar what a paper shin plaster is, on the left here, we have one from 1862. It's a paper 50 cents from Georgia Western Atlantic Railroad. But notice how the shin plasters were paid. If you'll notice down towards the center here where the 50 cent area is, it tells you it's redeemable in their notes, which are not legal tender by any means, but they're gonna give you paper for paper. Kind of an interesting process. And on the right is an 1863 Civil War good for token. Many of these were in circulation. There were hundreds and hundreds of these because it was a small, as I said, a, a shortage of small denomination value coins. Okay, some additional thoughts before we proceed here. The new silver coin would also help alleviate the shortage of small denomination coins in circulation. This is the key reason key reason why the three cent piece was put into service. Something needed to do it. The merchants didn't like the big large coins, the large copper one cent pieces at the time. The public hated them. They may have only carried one or two. Can you imagine carrying three to buy a stamp? It just wouldn't work. The heaviness, the weight, sort of the uh, Susan B. Anthony, let's say dollar of its day. But it would also serve as a means to ease, if not eliminate, a long-standing thorn in the side of the U.S. government. Again, we're talking here in 1851. Those Spanish one, half, two, four, eight reality pieces which circulated right along with U.S. coins. Government wanted to get those out of there. And so they found this is a good opportunity to do so. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, starting late in 1853, the price of silver, unfortunately, began to gradually increase, and silver coins again in circulation, including the three cent coin, were hoarded and disappeared from circulation. Stores, hotels, railroads also of interest began to pay premiums for these silver coins. Commercial life was again chaotic as vast quantities of silver coins, U.S. and Spanish, Spanish were still there, were melted and exported to Europe for a profit. Everybody's profit oriented. So here we take a look at the 1851 three cent silver and the new three cent stamp. <clears throat> Both made historic news of the day in the 1850s. Well, as a side note, one additional reason for shortage of small denomination values, including the three cent coins in circulation, needs to be addressed. This is seldom talked about, but it's there and it's factual. There was yet another use, or as I call it, a misuse for many of the 1851 to 52 three cent coins being removed from circulation. No, this was not hoarding of silver, but this was also done even before the Civil War. And down at your screen, I hope you'll take a look at the posed question with a answer. I'm sure that many of you probably have already guessed where it says think jewelry, but here was a reason for a lot of the three cent coins being taken out of circulation. They were involved in making them by jewelers, making them into love tokens, which was a popular fad at this particular period in our American history. On the, eight, on, on the left, we've got an 1851 obverse, well-worn, AG grade, Three hole coin. You see, people punched holes, drilled holes in them, and used them, kept them around their necks. The three cent silver love token on the right has an ornate design. Now, remember, this is a very thin coin. We'll go just to quick basics in just a few minutes as we get into looking at some of these pieces. But there was an ornate Y on it. Let's move on with another one here. Did you know that examples of the holes worn ones? Here's one here. It was actually cracked in half and on, on the left side of 1852, but it has an acid etching stain. It's interesting they use acid to try and stabilize this coin. Being so thin, it broke in half many of them. On the, on the right side, we've got an obverse from 1852. 
with an enameled star design. Look at the detail around that star. They increased it completely. So we got a lot of different things here to look at. A couple of simple love token designs. On the left, we have one from 1852, which is simply the letter O. And I took that to mean me, Ostromaki. So I had to have that for my collection as well. But it could also mean too, well, it could be a cent. And it looks like part of the three, Roman numeral three from the three cent coin later, the copper piece, was removed, so I called it two and a half cent coin, or is it? On the right, we've got an 1852 reeded edge. Well, probably a cog for some machine or clock or something, but it's interesting, they did call it a love token. And here's some more ornate designs of silver lo loverly jewelry pieces, as it was called, an 1863 coin with a larger hole punched in it, with a silver necklace love token. And on the right, we've got an 1863 made into a bracelet for a man. It was a token or a necklace or bracelet. Most of these, the men wore them, believe it or not, around their wrists, which seems strange for the time. And of course, here's some ones that can be very loverly and personally. The love token, these three set love token on the right from 1853. Can you make out the name? The word, the letter there is Fred. So take a while to move your eyes up and down and then follow over from left to right. And you can see the way they work the word Fred, but they have jewels hanging from the name. So this must have been a very good father. And of course, on the right is an 1854, my favorite love token, because it has the name Walter on it. And of course, I had to put this into my collection as well but it's very thin. Notice the scratching and all the stuff that they did in the back behind the name Walter. So you get an idea what it looks like. Okay, quick basic review here. So the idea of a three cent coin began in late 1848 and not as many people believe in 1851. Primary reason there under number one was an acute shortage of small denomination coins in circulation. And the major reason for it finally being created in the first place, as it, as it was needed in circulating coinage. Secondary reason that both in 1845, the heavy copper pieces, as we covered a little bit earlier, were just did not, were not accepted. That's why many of the larger cents you see, especially in the 1849 to 58 period, were not well circulated. They just were circulated and kept in people's pockets. Smaller copper half cents were not, were even scarcer because merchants very seldom use those. Again, it's like a Susan B. Anthony in a cash drawer today. Wasn't a very popular one to put into it. And there was no small cent at the time, so Congress didn't pass it either. So what small size denomination coins were there? Well, occasionally a silver half dime or a dime. That's about the only other small coins you had in, in circulation. By 1851, number five there, the small size value coins were even more acute in the shortage and made it absolutely necessary. And of course, because you know, Congress finally acted in 1851. They deleted the idea of a small silver coin and, from the bill, which approved the three cent coin. Number seven, 1851 passage of the three cent coin was also approved by the post office bill and also by the post office department calling it was an absolute necessity to purchase the stamps at that time. Hence the post office department embraced the three cent coin and actually lobbied for it during that time after their rate was lowered. So lastly there, so providence in the timing of an absolute need for a small silver size three cent coin along with a postage rate reduction combined to bring about the three cent silver denomination. Okay, now I'm sure you probably want to see some coins and we'll go through some of them. Not all of these are in my collection, but first we're going to cover the first part of the program, the three cent silver coinage, which lasted from 1851 to 1873. 
the year 1873, was the only proof issue. And at the bottom of your screen there, you'll find out why as we move along here. These were often called fish scale coins or trimes during this particular period. Again, we covered some basics earlier. Size, you look at the value, 0.03. Size, look at that, one grains, 14 millimeter, 0.55 inches. Thickness, 0 0.024. Boy, it's awful thin and flimsy, which made them again unpopular. But we've covered some of these and I just wanted you to have some time to see a little bit more detail on the basic facts behind it. Okay, now there are several major types as we're gonna find out, but there are two major design types or styles of three cent coins from the silver period from 1851 to 1873. And then the copper nickel began in 1865 and lasted until 1889. So these are the two major types on the left You've got a nice, beautiful 1851, which I don't know what the 1870, oh, I guess I added that there to discuss it anyway. Look at the beautiful golden toning starting. Look at the sharpness. We'll take a closer look and the beautiful copper. This is a brown copper nickel, three cent piece from 1865 to 1881. All right. The 1851 first year of issue, this is a type one, and we're gonna go through four different types. There's only three in your red book, but I separated mine into four in my collecting interest. But here we have a type one, MS-63 graded by NGC, it's toned, and I got arrows pointing to the clash marks. Imagine what a clash die would do to these coins, probably weaken them, breaking them, and eventually making them flimsy enough so that the people would break them, but they're just, there's clash marks all over the reverse one, top, bottom, here where the arrow sort. You can even see lettering down here below the numeral three on the right, but it's a fun coin. Now comes up a question. I'm sure most of you know, that perhaps one of the keys to this series is the 1851-0, first year of issue type one, a silver New Orleans mint, three cent coin. It was interesting, you're gonna find out as to why it was a one year only variety. The one here is an MS-66 PCGS plus graded. Look at that sharp, bold O. Didn't always have those, as we'll find out. Okay, and the 1850 O silver piece here, which is not the prize of my collection, is the one on the left. But the one on the right is the obverse of the particular coin. It's a poor two, and it has no date. But the reverse has what? Take a look above that arrow, and you can just barely see the old mint mark visible. So hence, this is one of the 720,000 originally minted at San Francisco. Again, this is my prize coin. I found this in a uh, we you often call them junk boxes, but uh, eh, we call them boxes to search through to find special finds for your collections. So why was the New Orleans branch mint also, you know, designated to strike a three cent coin? Again, you don't know much about this, but in doing research, it could be anyone's guess. But speculation at the time provides a couple of good reasons. Number one, the South had greater needs, especially New Orleans area, shipping docks, cargo ships coming in, people still getting off there, than the North. And the assumption could be that a New Orleans needed to have more small denomination coins in circulation. Hence, it was tapped by Philadelphia. Now remember, the New Orleans, New Orleans, New Orleans Mint had been producing large quantities of silver and gold coins since 1838 to meet commerce needs. So it was an, an obvious good choice by the Mint to make those coins and to get them into circulation in the New Orleans area. Shipping minted coins in 1851 from Philadelphia South was a very risky business. Shipping a single die, which would get lost, stolen, and be misused. 
The New Orleans Mint, of course, was established long ago, and so it was easier to use them. Remember, Charlotte and Dahlonega were established only to produce gold. They never had anything to use with silver. New Orleans, what? Both gold and silver. So there was the experience. And there was also that footnote at the beginning that small coinage denominations were very, very scarce in the South. Again, remember, there was no Denver, no Carson City, no San Francisco until 1854 and afterwards. And it, perhaps as they came on producing more small coinage, we find about 1855, the needs for the three cent piece in the South uh, actually tanked. And coins were then shipped to the West. As I noted just a little bit earlier, there are four basic design style or types of three cent silver coins. Types one and two. We'll start on the left with a type one from 1851 to 1853. And if you'll follow the arrow, you'll look at the star. There's no border. There's simply the outline of the star on it. Type two on the right side from 1854 to 1858. Notice the two lines around the original star. This was to enhance the design. And it was also made to strengthen the coin, believe it or not, and to keep it from turning ugly grayish colors. Again, the people didn't like it. That's why they called them fish scales because they looked like fish scales had gone over it. And we'll show one here in just a little bit after the other two types. On the left, we've got a type three, 1854 to 1858. Again, we find that there are two outlines on the obverse. And then we, take, we move to the reverse and we find that they added an olive sprig and arrows to the coin. Again, this was done to enhance the design and to prevent the ugliness these coins quickly turned to when they were in circulation. Type four from 1859 to 1873, we've got an obverse. Again, they went to just one outline on the particular three cent coin. And the reverse, well, look how different. They had tried to enhance the arrows and made the, the, the uh, olive sprig look oversized on the top of it. It actually can touch the top, the bottom part of the C and the top part of the Roman numeral three, the last Roman numeral three. And this is what I call a variety type, but usually they combine both of these into type three in the red book. Well, the 1853 commentary. Well, we'll take a look at that and we'll see that it called for a coin design change. Hence, we've had what you've already seen in design. Silver pieces were initially successful. They were in use primarily as a substitute for the small value coins and often used to buy postage stamps. However, the coins heavily use caused them to, cause them to show all sorts of problems. The coins were easily damaged, lost, much like the Panama pill was from back in its time. But the bullion alloy wore rapidly, and of course, it became less than the 0.75 silver in the early pieces. And as a result, well, the coin silver was changed in 1853. Well, hence, minting of the first type three coin, type one coins was suspended after 11.4 million pieces. Now remember the mint did not start producing these until late May and June until the order was set by the, the order was set by the federal government as well as the Congress of the United States. So the main problem to overcome, if you look on the right, I'm sure many of you have probably seen these in cherry picker boxes at shows, but they have silver in them still. But here's the 1853 old design type one circulated and the grade here is about very good. The piece of course has what an ugly, it looks like it's almost been in a fire and, and there was a lot of wear in certain areas, but the top part where the states is, there's actually a bend there, a bow on this particular piece. But hence you look at these black spots, that's where the fish scales part came in. 1854 is a new design, number two. 
which was struck here. And again, the grade's about extra fine, 45. So not too bad here, but the coloring is still there. So why was the redesigned 1854 cent metal content? And you may not be aware of it, but looking at your red book and other historical information, we find it was increased from 75% silver to 90% silver. And get this, while at the same time, its weight was reduced from 0 0.80 to 0.75 grams. This was done to further reduce its thickness and even made these ones from 1854 to 1858 thinner than the original ones. And of course, they easily broke, bent, probably people just threw them out and got rid of them. But it's an interesting thought as to why. Look at the big numeral here in 1854 on the coin, one of the largest date types. You can collect by that too. There were many dyes that were used. They didn't last very long. Well, the answer, the silver content was raised to 90% pure to encourage circulation. Ah, they figured that people are going to use them because it's the silver value behind it. But that didn't work. Instead, the increase in silver caused them to be continued to be hoarded and they did not circulate. Well, why? Again, they could be sent overseas, melted down for a, for a profit of the silver that was in them of the day. And the silver prices continued to rise as we'll see as we go along. So the 1854 commentary on the new type two. Well, again, another need for production change was necessary. The new coins were released, were, large, were larger in denominator and struck in silver to improve their appearance. However, they were thin, thin, and still easily damaged. The thin rims could at times after circulation actually cut people on their fingers and bankers that were handling them and merchants. And hence the quick wear, look at the mintages from the 11.4 million earlier down in 1854, the six, 671,000 and in 1855 to 139,000. There was still a need for small coins in circular. Yes, there was, but the coins continued to give the mint problems. And when they circulated, they were just awful. So another design change was made. The type three was made late 1854, and the type four reverse design change was again made in 1858. Below are pictured those two types. On the left is the type three, 1854 to 58 obverse with the two star lines. And of course, what was taken off? The olive branch. The type four, 1859 to 1873, the two star lines were put back on it, but the change also added the olive branch and arrows. Fascinating collecting them. So beginning in 1865, the three cent coin would also be produced in copper nickel, often called just plain copper pieces, but it was a combination of the copper nickel metal. Here's a beautiful 1865 coin from my private collection, almost perfectly centered. Notice the rim on the upper left side of the coin. It's, a little, it's probably about 1% off center, maybe one and a half. So that's kind of interesting. But notice the sharp detail, the shiny luster here. There's clash marks on the reverse here on the right side, left side of the coin on the first num numeral. Well, this was actually the beginning of the Civil War period, 1861 to 1865 coins. And then they did not see any further changes to the silver coins, which were also still in circulation at this time and of course being struck. The act of March 3, 1863 provided for a problem to deal with the shortage of money or small coins. And of course, most of you are aware of the US fractional currency piece, the three cent piece. Now, if you'll follow the arrows from the left across over Washington and down to the right side, you'll notice something maybe you've not seen you know, pay particular interest to on this 
three cent fractional currency piece. Receivable for what? All US stamps. So here we see again, there was still a need for something beyond a silver coin and thousands and thousands of these paper pieces were issued. But it's easier to have coins in a drawer than a large piece of paper. Well, the first silver proof coins, three cent coins, were struck in 1858 at a quantity of 210. The mint sold them, the lowest the price the mint sold them at, $1.03. So they made a dollar profit on each one of these 210 pieces. And the value today, well, give you an idea if you had one and kept it, a proof 63 is about $2,700. Proof 64, look at the jumps here, about $4,200. Proof 65, well, over 6,500. And this one here is a cameo from NGC, the highest they have seen graded. It's an NGC 66 plus. Look at the fields, I have not, but it's really, its cost is around $13,000. Again, this program was put together in 2019. So it's probably gone up since then. But take a look at the smaller dates, but take a look at the field as we call it. There's all sorts of brush marks, file marks in it as well. And there's a lot of weakness in the proof one here on the lower left hand of the stars. Yet it's graded MS 66 plus. Nice coin to have and add to your collection. Maybe for a Christmas gift this year, you never know. A few other varieties of silver three cent coins which merit inclusion in any collection. This is based on my recommendation. So you can take it or leave it. But it's just a thought if you want to have a nice sort. The 1861 contemporary counterfeit, we'll take a look at this. The two business strikes that were overdates, the 1862 over one overdate and the 1863 over two overdate. And the one proof strike overdate again, which was 1863 over 1862. And this is thought to be often a restrike from 1864. There's no actual documentation, but researchers that have looked at, it, especially NGC, have decided that it's most likely a restrike from the following year because there might have been demand for the 62 and 63 coinage, which had low mintages or proof strikes. Come on. I talked about the crude, and this is a crude as you can get. 1861 crude counterfeit has long been suspected as being made from what was dubbed at that time German silver. And that's actually a nickel alloy. And this was discovered and talked about back in the 1980s. This one here is from NGC's list in 1984. If you take a look at the through the center of the coin, looks like they had trouble striking the thin coin as well. A nice huge die crack from the states all the way down to the date, 1861. But it does have a little silver sheen. Notice the second Roman numeral on the reverse of it, broken, and it moves down, so the die was already damaged or just poorly designed when it was struck. The arrows are not there. The sprig, sprig on the olive leaf looks awful. The stars are, well, just there. But anyway, it'd be a nice to add, and you can buy these Prices around twenty to twenty-five dollars today on the market. Like the counterfeit eighteen sixty silver, sixty-one silver, but there's also some without any kind of metal. And again, we have here a worthy part of a three-cent coin history here: the German nickel on which we just saw, and of course the eighteen sixty-one counterfeit period. This on the right of your screen is an actual counterfeit made of that time. Now notice the dies don't line up, they're rotated with front, obverse, and reverse, and it's actually made out of mostly a clad or silver, a clad silver and copper metal alloy. So this might be one, and again, they're very inexpensive. It's always good to have some counterfeits, something additional, because once you complete a date set, well, you gotta look for other things. And we talked about the 61, 62 over 61 over date variety. There's a nice NGC example. This is not in my collection, but it belongs to NGC. What's an MS66 example? Take a look at the coin. And we're going to be able, on the left, it's the same coin, 
On the right, you can just barely see the one between the top loop of the two and the curl on the bottom. Not, not a good, not a bad job. If you notice that too, but take a look at the six. And at about 11 o'clock, there's a die break as well in that particular proof die. So when coins like proofs were issued back in the 1860s, especially for the three cent piece, they didn't really pay attention to collectors like us down in the future. They don't want those cracks and die breaks in coins. Here's a 63 over 62 overdate variety. Now this is a pathetic, uh, shall we say, uh, proof work. Here's the coin here on the left, beautiful toning on the reverse. But here, look at the two over three close-up of the proof and the arrow points down to it. It's just a terrible, terrible job by the mint redoing a die. It almost looks like the letters are just stuck on there by some kind of tape or glue. And there's a shadow effect, yes. I look at the top of the eight, look at the six all wadded together, the three, well, you can see where the two is still there from the top and bottom. So it makes an interesting one, but it's good to have. These are not too expensive. And of course, 1873 was the last year of the three cent silver coin. It was a proof only issue. And it's often listed in books as a closed three. It is not a closed three. It's a close and an open three of the two different denominations here that should be noted. And of course, the 1873, here is the open three. I put it right in there at the three so you can see the opening. So that was the open three. And of course here, believe it or not, is the close three on the left side at the arrow. So they're kind of interesting to have as well. Well, closing thoughts on the three cents silver. As a side note, the Civil War continued and the emergence by the federal government of paper began to wane the interest of a need for a three cent coin, whether it was in silver or whether it was in copper. And of course, the government print on their paper, as we saw, receivable for all US stamps. But it's interesting to note that production of the notes or coins began at 1.6 million and then just dropped off down to about 1,000 in 1872, the last year for the actual circulating ones. The proof the design, the cost in the Red Book and the New 21 start around $800 for many of the issues in MS-60, the regular. Okay, we're gonna move on real quickly and we're running out of time here. I don't wanna keep anybody any longer than is necessary, but the three cent copper nickel or bronze piece from 1865. This is, a, this is an easy one to go through because the whole time there were no changes to any dies. Few dates are proof issues only, and some dates had proofs higher than circulation pieces, as you will see. Proof pieces, proof only pieces from 1877, 78, and 86 had mintages larger than the 1883, 84, and 85 circulation pieces. Kind of interesting as to why. Looks like they were interested in the collector market, or they were waiting for the ANA to begin its development so they could encourage collectors to change. Well, the brief history we've covered, which is very similar to that of the silver piece, but during the Civil War, precious metals were being taken, melted, and the flying eagle in Indian sense began to quickly disappear from circulation. And so there were numerous reasons for the need to take to keep the silver back in the United States. And of course, it convinced the main vocal opponent to the copper piece, Congressman Kasson. And he finally saw the light after a few years and actually pushed the committee, his committee to authorize a change from silver to copper nickel. Anyway, I'm gonna go on real quick here, history, just some basic facts for those that view it later, similar. But notice the thickness, 1.15 versus one versus zero point, what was it, four five for the silver piece. But there are plenty of these available in grades from good to fine. Higher grades are tough to find. 
Now the first year of 1865 copper nickel three cent piece, here's one graded MS63. And we saw this particular coin a little bit earlier, having a die crack on the reverse between the top of the one and the rim, nice coin. So the design was simple, excuse me, unimaginative, flat, and two-dimensional. And who was responsible for this coin? James Longacre. And remember, people say, well, he designed a lot of coins, but remember his background. He was an accomplished portrait painter. And the head of liberty, nor, nor, nor Roman numerals, required very little imagination. <laughs> and answer the design, excuse me, the design was quickly accepted for the day. Interestingly, that both silver and nickel three cent coins were struck in 1865. And on the left, you have a fire damage one cleaned, which ran about 185 bucks back in 1876. It was only one of 8,000 8, pieces in circulation. Today, it's about $575 on the average. Uh, that's, an, that's an extra fine basic. And then again, we have here a cherry picker box found in 1977, one of the 11 million pieces struck and they value anywhere from seven to 10 and probably up to $15. <coughs> so why was the silver nickel or was the nickel piece struck? Well, along with the three cent silver, it was needed. And it was primary reason at that time of thinking in the 1870s, was it was a tradition and transition to legislation, collector demand. There's no real no as to why, but most of the silver coins were being quickly removed. We know that. And these copper nickel ones were not. Here's some high grade examples, both of silver and copper. On the right, you've got a silver, one eight with 8,000 pieces from 1865. And I love a tone coin. What Bob Campbell, past president of the ANA2, taught a lot about toning. He's got a great program. With, can you imagine only 500 pieces being struck here? There's no list as to what the mint sold it for, but I'll bet it was probably for a couple of three dollars at that time. And on the right, an 1865 nickel piece, one of the 11, you know, 0.3 million pieces struck. Again, it's a proof only 500 were struck. There were no design changes as mentioned in the three cents. So collecting these is easier. However, there are a few dates which I, on variations, which I thought you might find interesting. And there's even one outright counterfeit that was discovered a number of years ago. We have the 1863 nickel with both an open and closed three. The 1887 over six over date proof issue. And we talked about this one just now the 1880 copper looking counterfeit piece. We'll take a look at these. Here's the first nickel, the open and close. Much better, easier to see it here on the three cent copper pieces than it was the thinner ones. But you can see the very close or closed. This is from somebody else's writing here on the, the left and the open space for the three. On the coin, you can just see it. it's tough without a loop. And now this is one that was interesting. This is one that was discovered, I think, around 1990, if I recall correctly. But it's an 1883 nickel counterfeit. And how they made it look like it's a genuine piece. Well, most of you that know about counterfeit, you can see the doubling in states. You can see the pits, the bumps, the lumps, the overall weakness of Liberty's hair, and the bold size date. Look at that. Doesn't that date? look out of place with the rest of the design on the coin. There are so many pits and stuff on the reverse, it's easy to spot, but it looks like a genuine coin, which we've discovered it is not. Here is the 1887 over six proof over date. Again, a very sloppy work by the US Mint. Parts of the six can be clearly seen in the example on the right. If you look at that date, it looks like somebody just chiseled away at it did a terrible job. Can you imagine paying for a proof coin like that today from the U.S. Mint? It's not supposed to get out, but it'd make an interesting conversational piece, I'm sure. And the three only proof issues, of course, 1877, 
78 much better in design. Notice the small numbers, except when we get down to the 1886, 4,290 pieces. Reason for the demand? Well, it was thought probably to be the last year of issue. But here's the highest graded proof set from NGC. It's a registry set. It's one of only 900 minted and the highest grade ever given by NGC. I do not own this coin. It belongs to NA NGC. So why was there a sudden increase in the mintage from 88? Again, people thought the coin was rumored it was going to be discontinued. It will be discontinued in 1888. Again, look at the date. Look at the large size numbers. It's a real mystery, but people thought it was going to be and there were a lot of collectors, I assume, at that particular time. 1889, the last year of the three cent issue. A regular here, strike, MS66. Look at the beautiful toning. I just love toning on the coins. And here's the proof issue as well, a beautiful proof issue. So the demise of the three cent coin. Well, it was never in either silver or nickel, very popular after a while. Proof issues, of course, for collectors were nice, but many of them, unfortunately, from 1858 on, many of the proofs, even if there was 210 pieces, were eventually melted down. Interesting. But the Mint, of course, kept no records, and this was done on by the, act, by the Mint Act of 1873. When the coinage was abolished, the silver three-cent piece was hardly missed, and it went unnoticed for years. No one knows how many stamps they bought. But in one closing remark here, I don't want to be redundant, but a lingering question remains. Did the silver three cent piece ever officially become a legal tender issue coin? Give you a few moments to think about it, and then we'll put up the slide if it was, and when did this happen? You may be surprised to learn the answer is correct. But oddly enough, it was done in the Coinage Act of 19, that's 1965, not 1865, the very year that silver was removed from all the US circulating coins. Well, with that, our adventure, I hope you enjoyed the little bit of history and stories behind some of the coins. But thanks for attending this particular program. And as Porcia said here, well, maybe it's fitting to end the program. And so therefore your speaker is ending his talk. So Andy, I will turn it back to you. Andy, for some reason, I can't hear you. I don't know if you can hear me. Oh, can you hear me now, Walt? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, okay, I'm sorry. No, that was my... That's that was okay. Yeah, in case there's questions asked or something. <laughs> All of a sudden... I, no, I was just I was wondering, <laughs> yeah, when you were talking about this, and again, I guess I'd read about it, but it never struck me, but is this the only time in, in U.S. Mint history that a denomination of a coin was being made in two different materials and designs at the same time? You are absolutely correct in that thing. And it, you know, we'd wonder why, because the silver is being hoarded, why would they make both? And, and who knows? I, you know, I wish we could have been there at the Mint where they were making these coins to find out the answer to such a question. But it is it just interesting. And maybe again, I would say, maybe it was the collector interest. There might have been. I don't know. Yeah, how that's what I was thinking about them. for those yeah. last... Uh, issues of the silver pieces was it because yeah. it was a very negligible amount being made um i just found it interesting yeah and, and that would be the only reason just like they with the trade dollars they went beyond the first couple of years and they went what five six years I, maybe there was collector interest 
right uh, uh so, someone wants to know where they would buy a counterfeit 1861 piece boy i don't have any dealers that deal with it you can try online sometimes on ebay they might have those counterfeits up there but they want way too much with the price but all I can say is, you know, check a larger collector. Or be, I can't suggest anyone being a, an officer of the ANA, but many of the larger dealers might have it. Or just Google maybe three cent uh, coin dealers, three cent US coin dealers. That might give you a, a starting point. Uh, so you talked a lot about, uh, or a little bit about love tokens, Walt. Uh, someone's asking, uh, they have a, a three cent love token with a hole in it. Huh? Does the hole, um, hurt the value of a love token like that generally it can it can but it's only a minor there people are collecting those for the love coin rather than the hole in the coin but love coins were made to be worn by either the man or the woman in some form necklace bracelet or so forth they were even put on shoelaces at the time when those started up in the 1870s so it's basically designed and they i we wish we had a record of how many jewelry stores at that time made these coins can you imagine them going down to the bank oh give me a hundred three cent coins okay and they made love tokens out of them but i'll bet a lot of them broke in half and they the designs were like the earlier one with the etching of the acid into it to try and strengthen it so it'll be interesting to find out but again there's not much research ever done on this particular u.s coin does anyone ever uh, have any other questions for walt If you have some afterthought, Andy, you'll put up the uh, contact for it at money.org. They want to follow up too. So. Yeah. Um, just so I don't butcher this, uh, Walt, uh, O-S-T-E-R-M-E-C-K-I. O-S-T-R-O. R-O. Oh, I'm sorry. You're fired. <laughs> M-E-C-K-I. Fourth last name at money.org. If you have ever have any questions about the three, three cent piece, uh, Walt is happy to answer that for you. I'll, I'll look at your collection if you want to show me some pieces as well. But Ostromacki at money.org, and it gets to me, not a problem. I'm glad to help any collectors or just see something special that they have and want to share. So, uh, One person wants to uh, just pick your brain. You've obviously been into this coin for quite a while, Walt. How has the collecting interest changed over the years, if any? I would say there's probably a few more collectors now. Now, trying to justify what a few more was, I don't know. But I began collecting in 1980, uh, 19, I think it was 1980. And the person that talked me into getting involved was a well-known numismatist from Georgia, Bill Fever. And he said, oh, I've heard of that guy. Yeah, you've heard of that guy. That many people probably have too. But he says, well, if you got to collect something offbeat. He says, you're always offbeat in the topics, things you share. He says, why don't you get an interest in it? So he took me down to the floor. We had a, a show in, in Dalton, Georgia. He says, look, there's all these cherry pickers box. If you'll pick out the three cent pieces, I can use them in my cherry pickers box. But I want to see what you have. And so I got hooked on it. I guess Bill Fever gave me the impetus to do that. <laughs> uh, it, well, I, I have a feeling Bill's probably uh, sparked a lot of beginning interest in thousands of collectors across the country. So that's I'm probably- sure he has. Yeah. Well, well, thanks again. Okay, uh, it was a great presentation. Um, if somebody wants to watch that again, we do post all of our e-learning seminars on our website and you just have to figure out uh, uh, past seminars and you can uh, look at all of the different topics that we've, we've covered over the last uh, almost two years now. Uh, also pretty good news. I've re I recognize a lot of the names on the people who are logged on right now. Summer seminar is a go. Yes. For next June, the last two weeks in June, um, I don't want to butcher the dates. I think the last session is 25th through the 30th, and then the first one is, you know, the five days pre uh, preceding that. But we're excited. Uh, we've missed you guys in the last couple of years, so we're excited to have it uh, have it be a go again at Colorado College. So please, in the coming months, not right now, we're going to be posting our catalog. So check it out, and we would love to see you again out here. Also, we have our spring show here in Colorado Springs in mid-March. So I know it's kind of a trek for a lot of people, but if you can make it, we'd love to have you. 
Um, and Andy, in my mind, interrupt. It's 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 through you know um, March 11th to the 14th, but it's at the Broadmoor, and this is a if you want to call it a 10 star, 10 diamond hotel, it's a great place. It has all sorts of stuff for the wives, for the kids, shopping, all sorts of events, and they're there. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. The AMA got a special price from a new individual that that was taking charge of this, and so you'll never get that. I think it's one hundred seventy nine dollars a day, no resort charge fee. You can't beat that. It yeah, just, I'm thinking about getting a night just so I can <laughs> say that I stayed at the Broadmoor. Quite honestly, but for yeah, for those of you who are not familiar with the Broadmoor, there's a lot of different eating options. Five star resort. Uh, you also have Pikes Peak out here, the Air Force Academy, Garden of the Gods, a lot of beautiful things. So. Join us for that. Well, we also um, will be having a uh, tour on Thursday night, I think it is, a reception at the ANA headquarters, according to Kim. So I thought yes, and that. that's something that I've been working on. Okay, I'm sorry. We've got a, we've got a new exhibit, the Medal in America, and that's going to feature medals from the recent uh, 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 Dwight Manley donation, the Baker Manley collection that came here to the ANA, as well as a lot of other medals that we have here in, in uh, at the ANA and also some loaned items. So. That's something that I've been working on quite a bit. It should be a good time. We'll eventually have it all online as well. Once again, I got to give a shout out to the Gray Sheet for their continued support of our e-learning program. We've got some other stuff coming up here in the next couple of weeks that I think should pique your interest. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks, Walt, and have a good rest of the day. All right. Thank you, folks. Thank you.